you probably remember when you were learning to swim or when your kids were learning to swim that you told them, okay, you go out and you can play in the pool, but don't go in water that's over your head. Because you knew as they were learning to swim, they still weren't capable of surviving in deep water. But you also know that if they're going to ever truly learn how to swim, they're eventually going to have to venture into deeper and deeper water so they can learn how to uh, manage in the depth of the water. That's kind of what Paul has been talking to us, or the author of Hebrews has been talking to us about in the study of Hebrews that we're involved in. In chapter 5 and 6, he was saying to them, look, you guys are still acting like you can't go into deep water. You're still in the shallow end of the pool. and You've been there too long. It's time for you to start learning how to really <laughs> swim. Now, it's important that we not um, come to new believers and immediately start talking to them about Melchizedek because they're going to glaze over. It's kind of like talking to a first grader about calculus. You know, let me talk to you about calculus. A kid doesn't, I don't understand anything you're saying when you're talking to me about calculus. But eventually, if we're going to grow in our knowledge of math, if we're going to grow in our knowledge of swimming, if we're going to grow in our knowledge of God, we've got to start getting into deep water. Well, we're going to have that opportunity over the next several weeks because we are in a section of Hebrews that is deep water. And perhaps as you have been listening to Rick read Hebrews chapter 7 today, you found yourself saying, I have no idea what this is about. Now because of that, I am going to give you a, a little simple guideline. First of all, in order to understand difficult passages, sometimes you need to pull back just a little bit to see the big picture, to understand what really is going on here. And understand that the book of Hebrews is trying to make a single point that Jesus is superior to any other system of religion, including that of Judaism. The idea is that, that maybe the book of Hebrews was written to Christians who came out of Judaism, and now life is getting hard. Persecution is coming upon them, and they're thinking that maybe they should go back to Judaism, where things were more uh, status quo, where, where you could just do your own thing and nobody would bother you. And so the argument here is don't do that. You are, at, you are where you need to be right now. Don't go back to that which is lesser. And so at the beginning, he talked to us about how Jesus is superior to worshiping angels. Then he said Jesus is superior to Moses, who is the great lawgiver. And now he's going to talk to us about how Jesus is superior to Abraham and to the priesthood. And next week, we're going to see that Jesus is superior to the sacrificial system and to the temple and the Jewish worship experience. So that's the big picture. Now, what happens sometimes when we go into talking about um, the end times, for example, we get all zeroed in on particular images, for example, in the book of Revelation. And so we, we are, we're so focused on the image that we're missing the bigger picture of what's being said here. The, basically, the book of Revelation tells us that God wins. Okay? You know, that's, that's the general gist of the book. Here the book is telling us that Jesus is superior. So what we're going to do is we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, rereading the book. I'm going to draw everything from Hebrews chapter 7, but I'm not going to read a lot of the verses to you because I don't want you to get too bogged down, even though you need to wrestle with these things. Right off the bat, he tells us that Melchizedek is kind of like Jesus, that Melchizedek is a good picture of Jesus. Now, this Melchizedek guy is, is, a, is kind of a weird cat um, because we only read about him in the book of Genesis. Abraham's um, nephew, Lot, gets captured, and he gets taken away. So Abraham gets his commandos. I mean, he's desperately outnumbered, but he's got strong fighting men, and they go and they rescue Lot. And they defeat this massive army. And when they're coming back, two kings come out to talk to Abraham. One was Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and the other was the king of Sodom. And you remember Sodom from Sodom and Gomorrah. And so you've got the good king, the one who was a priest to the Most High God, Melchizedek, and the king of Sodom. So the king of Salem, Melchizedek, comes out and brings bread and drink, and Abraham is appreciative, and so Abraham gives them a tenth, a tithe of everything that they won in the battle. 
The king of Sodom says, I want to help make you rich. I want to make sure that you have all these spoils that you can really benefit. Abraham says, no, I want nothing to do with you. Now, from that picture, that's the whole picture. That's the whole story of Melchizedek. And then he occupies this huge place in the book of uh, in Psalm 110. David talks about somebody who is going to come that's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And I'm sure people at that time went, what? And then we get to Hebrews, and this becomes a major deal, talking about Melchizedek. So let's break it down. Melchizedek is like Jesus in a number of different ways. First of all, he was a king and a priest. That's unique. In Judaism, that couldn't happen, because in order to be a king, you had to descend from David. In order to be a priest, you had to descend from Levi. It'd be like saying, in order to be president of the United States, you have to prove that you have descended from George Washington. In order to be a pastor, you have to prove that you de descended from Martin Luther. And so the two probably never meet. And so in Judaism, you wouldn't have a king and a priest. Couldn't happen. Jesus is actually a king and a priest. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he is the one who intercedes for us. And so Melchizedek becomes a picture of how Jesus is different from the kings and priests in Israel. Second, Melchizedek has a unique name. His name means, Melchizedek means king of justice. And being the king of Salem, or later on it would be called Jerusalem, means king of peace. And the author is saying, look, this is a great picture of who Jesus is. He is the one who brings justice and he is the one who brings peace. He is the one who brings um, satisfaction for our sin, justice, by giving his life as a sacrifice and he is the one who brings peace deep in our soul. So he's like Melchizedek in that sense. The third thing we see is that the priesthood was not based on any um, genetic or um, he, it wasn't because of his family line. And we see here that this, there is no record, this is verse 3, there is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Now, I don't think the author of Hebrews is trying to say to us that uh, this Melchizedek guy, he was never born and he never died. He just appeared. He didn't have a mom or a dad. It's just that those things aren't mentioned. So in a sense, he resembles Jesus. We don't know anything about this guy's heritage. We don't know how he became the king. We don't know how he became a priest of the God Most High. What we do know is that he just appeared. And in a very similar way, Jesus is eternal. Jesus was before Abraham, and Jesus will be here long after the earth is done. And so he becomes a priest that can minister forever. Then he goes on and he talks about how Melchizedek's priesthood is actually superior to the Jewish priesthood. And that's a, a long, complicated thing here. But here's, let me try to break this down for you. When Melchizedek came out to Abraham, Abraham paid him a tithe. The argument is that you give a tithe to somebody that is superior to you. The employee does not pay the employer. The employer pays the employee. The boss pays the worker, not vice versa. Okay, that's the way this works. Now, the argument that he makes is people in Israel paid their tithe to the Levites. The Levites were descended from Levi, from Aaron, from Moses, who ultimately came from Abraham. Okay, so here's the chain of command. So in a sense, Israelites were honoring Abraham because of that chain of command. I hope you see that. They paid the Levites. The Levites belonged to Abraham. And then he says, and Abraham, guess who he paid a tithe to? Melchizedek. Which means Melchizedek is higher on the order than the Levites. So the argument is that the priesthood of Melchizedek is actually superior to the priesthood of Israel. The second thing he says that makes it superior is that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Again, 
this is an argument of the greater to the lesser. That since Melchizedek blessed Abraham, that meant that Melchizedek was greater than or had more authority over or had spiritual authority over Abraham. Therefore, the priesthood of Melchizedek is better than the priesthood of the Jews or the Levites. Third, he tells us that if the Jewish priesthood was sufficient, why was it that the Bible was always looking forward to another day? In Psalm 110, David says we're looking forward to that priest who comes in the order of Melchizedek. And the author here is saying that why would David be looking for a greater priesthood if the current priesthood was sufficient to do the work of God? I know it's convoluted. I know it's confusing. But it's an argument basically saying that, look, you, you say you can't understand how Jesus is different from the Jewish priests. Jesus is like this Melchizedek. He is superior to everything that you know. He is superior to all the hope that you're putting into the things of this world. Then he gives us five reasons why Jesus is the superior priest. Number one, verse 17, he was appointed by God. The Levitical priests were appointed by the high priest. They, they basically were appointed just because they were born. They were born from the tribe of Levi. They were born priests. Jesus was picked. Jesus was selected. Jesus was commissioned by God himself. Therefore, he's a better priest. Second, we're told in verse 22 that Jesus guarantees a better covenant. Now, we're going to talk more about covenant in the weeks ahead. I know this is going to cause many of you to just go, oh boy, because we, these are words that we don't understand, right? The Old Testament covenant was a relationship where God said, here's the deal. I am willing to bless you as long as you continue to put me first in your life. As long as I am first, I will bless you. Well, we know what happened. The Jews would wander off. Individuals just like us would wander off and we drift from God. Therefore, God would have to turn away because the covenant was actually broken. Some people say that what God said was if you, if you do all the good things that you need to do, then you'll get to go to heaven. Basically, that's a fair summary. It's not completely accurate, but it's fair. What Jesus does is he comes in and he says, I'm going to make a promise to you. If you will trust me as your Savior, that I will make you brand new, and I will make you part of my family. So Jesus brings a better covenant. Jesus brings a different covenant. And not only does he initiate this new covenant, we're told that he guarantees it. He guarantees it. The, the priests could only say, look, um, we've offered sacrifices, so you're okay with God right now. We don't know what's going to happen when you leave here, because you might sin again, and you're going to be on the bad side of things. But for right now, you're okay. Jesus says, you come to me, and you are made new. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. We say, but I still act the same way. I'm still having problems. God has paid the price. Jesus has taken our place. He has done what is necessary. As we've said many times on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It's finished. So Jesus guarantees a better covenant. Third, we're told that priests serve temporarily, but Jesus' priesthood is eternal. If you've uh, been around the various churches, um, shame on you. No, um, if, if you've been to various churches over the course of time, what you found is that, that as pastors leave, the church kind of changes. Because a new pastor comes in, he's got his own ideas, he's got things that he wants to do. He's not really aware of, of the history of some of the traditions that are going on there. He doesn't know the story of the people in the church and therefore, things are different, and sometimes things are uncomfortably different. And, and I hope, I hope, what you're discovering is that there's some real advantage of a long-term pastor. I mean, there are good things and bad things about knowing your stories. Um, some of those help me have more compassion towards you. Some of them just make me sick. You know, I just, oh, why did I get this group of people? 
But the truth is, you know my story too. And, and so there, there's a greater sense of intimacy, a greater sense of effectiveness. But even in a long-term pastorate, eventually, I'm going to die. And somebody else is going to step in here. And you say, well, we know who it is. It's the boy, right? <laughs> Could be. He's, his, you know, he's, his, his books are in a box so that he can move right into my office. He's ready to go. Any time that I clonk off, he's ready to move over. But eventually, new people will come in. And things will change. Well, the, the argument here is that, that that's what happens in the Jewish priesthood. That even though a high priest might serve for a long time, eventually he dies. And then things change again. And you've got to start all over. And you've got to bring people up to speed. He says, what's great about Jesus is that he is the high priest that will be there forever. He never needs to be brought up to speed. He never needs to be informed. He never needs to be taught. He never needs to go through a time of, of, of internship. He is always there. He's always aware. He's always exactly what we need. He is the high priest that we can count on forever. Fourth, we are told that he is holy rather than sinful. And in verse 27, he, he talks about that. 26 and 27, he says, the problem with the Jewish priesthood was that, that those guys, though they were trying to do what God had called them to do, and they were trying to do it effectively, the thing is they were just guys. Isn't that the truth here? Um, as, as effectively as I might try to represent Christ to you, I'm still just a man. I'm just a man that struggles just like you do. Um, there's a sense in which the high priest or the priest of Israel we're just like the blind leading the blind. One sinful person trying to help another sinful person to be right with God. Imagine Rick calling me up this afternoon and saying, Bruce, I'm having car problems. Could you come over and help me? Well, how dumb would that be? That's the blind leading the blind. Neither one of us knows what we're doing. Let's pop the hood and look at it and go, it looks fine to me. The engine's still there. <laughs> Man, and, 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 and we've exhausted our ability. You know, uh, truly, we, we're done at that point. We need to bring somebody in who actually knows something about it. And the Jewish priesthood was like that, is what the author's saying. That, that it was the blind leading the blind. That the first thing that a Jewish priest had to do every day was come in and, and offer a sacrifice for his own sin. And then he could turn around and offer sacrifices for the other people. We're saying, well, Jesus doesn't have to do that. Jesus is the one who has conquered sin. Jesus is the one who was unstained by sin. Jesus is the one who actually knows how to gain victory. So why would you turn away from him to a person who's just a man? Incidentally, that's a good idea, something you need to keep in mind. Don't put your trust in a pastor. Put your trust in the Savior who the pastor is trying to represent. And finally, he says, Jesus made a sacrifice that was once and for all. Once and for all. The Jewish priesthood was kind of frustrating. That you would commit certain sins, and you would bring your animals, and you would sacrifice them, and then you would leave. And then you'd sin some more. So you'd get some more animals, and you would come back to the temple. It was just like, you, you just not like on this conveyor belt. You just kept going around and around and around because we are sinful people that we'll see later in Hebrews that he talks about that, that the blood of bulls and, and goats cannot cleanse the conscience. It can cleanse us externally, but, but we need something much deeper than that. And that's what Jesus does because he is able to offer a sacrifice that is a final sacrifice, a sacrifice that accomplishes for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves a sacrifice in his own life, in his body, that says, I have paid for your sin, past, present, and amazingly, future. Not that we should live recklessly, but Jesus is saying, I have paid the price. That's the argument of chapter 7. Now, it's possible that you've reached this point, and you said, I still don't get it. 
I still don't get this. Well, I'll be honest with you, every time I read Hebrews 7, 8, and 9, there's parts of it that makes me kind of scratch my head. Think, boy, could he have stated this any more unclear? But for the Jews, this made perfect sense. We're just outside of that uh, reach. We know that Jesus is superior to the priests, but we don't have any priests. So what does this mean to us? Well, let me give you some ideas. Just like the Jews were being told, don't, don't go back. Don't go back to that which is insufficient. Don't go back to that which is comfortable simply because it's comfortable. Go to that which can save you. For us, we would say, don't go back to the idea that you're going to be saved by your good deeds and by the godly lives that you live. You know, the people who say, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I tithe. I have devotions every day. I've served in many capacities. Those things can't save you. They're good things, but they can't save you. We look at our religious formulas. We say, well, I go to worship. I take communion. I do other things. I, I, I'm baptized. I, I'm part of a board or a committee. Those things can't save you. Don't go back to the works mentality. Don't go back to that idea that you can earn salvation. We trust our experiences. We say, well, I, I feel close to God. I feel like God probably understands what I'm doing. Don't go there. Go back to the fact that, that Jesus has paid the price for our sin, and he alone, through his grace alone, can save us. We trust our friendships and the influential people that are around us. Like, God's going to be impressed with the people that we know. Well, God, you, you know who my friends are. God doesn't care. We trust our church. We trust uh, our, our religious practices. We trust the way we worship. We trust all kinds of things instead of him. And we even trust, like the Jews, our sacrifices. Look at what I've given up, Lord. Look at what I've given to you. The message here is don't go back to that way of thinking. Don't go back to that way of life. Understand that Christ has set you free. He has put you in a position where you are no longer a slave trying to earn the favor of the king. You are a child of the king. You are part of the king's family. The message is pretty simple. If you turn to anyone or anything other than Jesus, you need to be reminded that Jesus is the only effective and sufficient Savior. You may be trying really hard to earn your place in God's kingdom. And even the best of us fail miserably on occasion. We, we have spurts of goodness. Most of us do. We have a few days where we go, well, I did good today. I serve the Lord today, but tomorrow's coming. And we'll probably stumble. Jesus has done everything necessary for us to be right with God. You can get off the treadmill. You can stop looking over your shoulder. You no longer need to feel frustrated at your failures. The Lord has done what is necessary, and only, only he has done that. It boils down to the same issue. Are you going to put your trust in what Jesus has done, or are you going to trust something else? Are you going to walk in the freedom that he gives you, or are you going to go back to the bondage that you're comfortable with? Are you going to turn back to your old ways? You're going to trust the new life that he's given to you. To turn back is to go in the wrong direction. So at the start of this new year, I want to encourage you to ask, where do I look for meaning in life? What or who are you trusting for the future? How did we get here, and where is it that we're going? Is life really just a roll of the dice? Is that all it is? Is it, is it just a gamble and we get whatever we get? Or is there more? Is this life really just a mad dash to nothingness? Or is there one that can lead you home? To go in any other direction is to turn from the best to something or someone that doesn't measure up. I've become convinced by abundant evidence that Jesus is the only way to find life. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So wake up. Run to him. 
Don't let the trials of your life cause you to turn back. It's worth the journey. It's worth the effort. It's worth giving up everything you have to pursue this one who alone can set you free. So let me ask you, have you reached that point in your life where you realize that you can't get to heaven by being good? Do you understand that you are a rebel who is lost without Jesus? The arms of Christ are open. The invitation still stands. He says, come to me. Give up the futility. Stop fighting. And just let me love you and save you. If you haven't done this, I hope that you would start the new year right. And occasionally I want to give you a prayer, not because the prayer gets you into heaven. That, that's not what it does. This is just a guideline of something that you might want to say to God. Jesus, I believe you did for me what I could not do for myself. You gave your life to pay for my rebellion and sin, and that staggers me. You rose from the dead to show that your payment was sufficient and available to anyone who would trust you. So today, I trust you. Today, I choose to walk with you and to honor you by the way that I live my life. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and to begin the process of building your character more and more into my life. I receive the gift you have given me, and I do it gratefully and humbly. It isn't easy to learn to swim in deep water. However, swimming's a lot more fun if you can swim in the deep water, if you can learn how to dive and you can enjoy all the great things that water can provide for you. And in the same way, it's not easy to understand all the parts of the Bible. But the more we wrestle with texts like this, the more we refuse to run away from them and, and learn how to swim in these deep waters, the more anchored and stable we will become. And because we are anchored, when the storms of doubt, uncertainty, and failure bombard us, we won't turn and run. We will hide in the one who is sufficient to protect everyone and anyone who puts their trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand what you're trying to get across to us without getting us uh, too weighted down by terms and concepts and illustrations that are really a little bit beyond where we are. Lord, we don't fully understand everything that is being talked about with Melchizedek. But we do understand, what we do see as the point, is that you are the only one who can save us. Any other direction we turn, any other efforts that we make, trusting in ourselves, trusting in others, trusting in our good deeds, are all insufficient. Only you can make us new. And so, Father, as we start this new year, we pray that you would change our perspective that you would get us off the treadmill of futility, that you would turn us away from this mad rush to try to prove to you that we are worthy of your love, and instead to simply embrace this love that comes to us even though we don't deserve it. Help us to entrust ourselves to you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.